Okay, so um, I'm going to make a start then. So uh, just to welcome you uh, to this evening's uh, virtual talk from the uh, uh, the Yorkshire group of the Royal Meteorological um, Society. So just to go through a little bit of uh, housekeeping, how uh, the functionality uh, works. So if you just look at your top bar, there is uh, two arrows pointing uh, into the centre at each other. So that allows you to uh, go between full screen and uh, less full screen. I don't know where the left. Um, and then beside that, there's an arrow uh, pointing at a, a vertical line. And if you click that, that removes the chat bar at the side. So it toggles the chat bar. And then if you toggle the chat bar off, um, then that gives you an option with there's a button that says chat and there's two speech bubbles. So if you press that, uh, the chat functionality uh, comes back. Um, if you actually activate the chat functionality, you can see that we've got a variety of different options. So uh, there's chat, which you can see people um, joining in tonight. And then next to that, there's polls. So um, we're always interested to see where people are, are actually coming from. So, um, you know, their background and your, uh, how you whether you're a member of the Royal Meteorological Society. Um, or not. Um, there's no handouts tonight. This is not a lesson. This is this is simply for uh, fun. So there's no handouts. So just to explain how the chat function works. So if you have a question um, for Ailish tonight, if you put it into the chat function, and then what we can do is we can flag it um, as a uh, a question, and then we when we go back uh, at the end of the talk, we can go back and go through those questions. So if you do have a question, just put it into the chat. We'll spot it. It will be flagged as a question and we can come back to it um, at the end of the talk. So uh, Ailish's talk is going to be about 40 minutes tonight. So that will leave a uh, 15 minutes or so um, for questions um, afterwards. And just so just to introduce uh, Ailish Graham. So uh, Ailish is actually a PhD student uh, at the School of Earth and Environment in Leeds. Um, and she started, she did a BSc uh, at the University of Bangor in geological oceanography. And then following that, she uh, she moved to Leeds um, and did uh, the MRes. So that's a Master's of Research uh, in Climate uh, and Environmental Science. And then uh, from that, she followed on uh, to do a PhD and her PhD uh, is looking at uh, air quality across the UK. But during her PhD, um, she worked on uh, the health impact of Saddleworth Moor. Um, and then uh, we had the Australian wildfires, which she, she will talk about. So she applied the same analytical tools that she'd learned from that to look at the, or that's what she's doing right at the moment, uh, to the impact of the Australian wildfires. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'll hand over um, to Ailish. Hi everyone. Um, so as Jim said, I'm currently finishing off my PhD and um, tonight I was going to talk about two of the topics that I've looked at um, during my time um, in Leeds. So um, two case studies of fires, one in the UK over Saddleworth Moor and then um, another in Australia um, last year. Uh, and this will be focused on the impacts of those fires on air quality and human health. So I just thought I'd give a bit of background to start with. So ambient air pollution in the atmosphere is formed of a complex mix of pollutants. And these are from a range of different sources. So we can see on this figure on the left, um, the sources can range from natural sources like wildfires, or volcanoes to more anthropogenic sources. So for example, industry or transport. And air pollutants can be uh, emitted directly into the atmosphere and these are referred to as primary pollutants. And they can be emitted as either an aerosol or a gas species. So for an aerosol species could be something like particulate matter. And this could be formed of um, soot or dust and gases which are emitted directly into the atmosphere um, can come from a range of sources 
So things like NOx, um, which are emitted from traffic, sulfur dioxide um, from volcanoes, carbon monoxide, which comes from a range of incomplete combustion, so wildfires and also industry. And then also um, gases like ammonia, which are released primarily through agriculture. But we can also get um, something called secondary pollutants, which aren't emitted directly, but they're formed from these primary pollutant precursors. And they can also be aerosols or gases. So a good example of a, an aerosol secondary pollutant would be um, particulate matter, um, where ammonia and, um, uh, and sulfuric acid uh, react to form ammonium sulfate. Or we can get them uh, secondary pollutants in the gas form. So, for example, ammonium or ozone. And the concentration of air pollutants in any particular location. So, for example, this house on the beach are controlled by, firstly, those primary pollutant emissions. And then secondly, the, the formation of secondary pollutants in the atmosphere. And then finally, the dispersion and accumulation of these pollutants, which is largely controlled by the weather. And the, one of the main reasons that we're, we're concerned about air quality is because it's a leading environmental risk. So in the UK, it is the leading environmental risk to public health. And generally, PM 2.5 has the strongest evidence for negative health impacts from exposure. And these can be um, seen on both short and long time scales. So on the top, uh, short time scale, so for example, a pollution episode, we see that um, there's exacerbation of asthma and also other respiratory problems. And this leads to an increase in uh, hospitalizations and also mortality. And then we also have the long term impacts. So this is from chronic exposure over long time scales, more than years. And what we see is this that exposure to PM 2.5 over these long time scales has been um, associated with increases in stroke um, and lung cancer, as well as other respiratory conditions like COPD and also heart disease. And this all leads to a reduced life expectancy. But alongside um, PM 2.5, we also see negative health uh, um, impacts for other pollutants. So for ozone and nitrogen dioxide. And here I'm showing some of the mechanisms for those health impacts from PM 2.5. So first, the PM 2.5, which is smaller than a human hair, is breathed deep into the lungs because it's such a small particle. And once in the lungs, it can cause irritation to them. But it can also cause changes to the blood and the blood vessels and also changes to the heart and its functions, as well as in impacting on the brain. And we know that the health burden of PM 2.5 is large in the UK. So long term exposure to PM 2.5 in the UK leads to 28,000 deaths being brought forward each year. And if we uh, also account for NO2 um, exposure in the UK, we see that this rises to 36,000 deaths each year. And this, um, the sources that are responsible for these health impacts vary by region. So if we split the uh, health impacts of PM 2.5 based on the, the emission sources, so these are shown on the right by the colours, for different regions of the world, we can see that, for example, in Europe, um, agricultural emissions really dominate this health impact of PM 2.5. So that's from the emission of ammonia that then forms secondary PM 2.5 in the atmosphere. And then in other regions of the world, like Australia, um, parts of Africa and South America, this is more dominated by the wildfires, which is shown by the brown colour. And we think we we know that this is projected to increase in the future um, since climate change is affecting wildfires. 
So this is because um, climate change causes this feedback loop. So climate change causes a, a, a rise in global temperature, which then leads on to snow melting sooner in many areas of the world or spring occurring earlier. And this leads to a, a build up and a dry out of fuel, which means that um, forests are drier for longer. And so that increases the fire risk in those forests. And then as a result, fires become worse and they emit more air pollutants and also greenhouse gases, which in turn cause the atmosphere to warm further and then begin this loop all over again. And this all leads to increased population exposure to air pollutants from fires and therefore a larger health burden um, due to fires. So in regions where fires already occur, they're projected to become larger and more intense. So we saw this, some examples of this um, last year. So we saw that in the Amazon, some of the largest fires they'd ever seen occurred. Um, and much of the Arctic was on fire um, during the summer. And then this culminated in these mega fires in Australia at the end of the year and into 2020. But alongside this, there's also an increased risk of wildfires in regions that previously weren't prone to them. So a good example of this was the Saddleworth Moor fire in 2018, which is one of the largest wildfires um, that's been seen in the UK. And we can measure pollutants from fires. Um, so we can do this using ground-based observations. And here I'm showing the UK uh, ground-based observation network um, called the ORN um, for the Northwest region. And this monitors pollutants at hourly time scale. Uh, but what we see is these um, automated urban and rural sites that are measuring air pollutants are generally located close to large populations. So we've got two in Leeds and one in Bradford that are close to us. And so this means that measurements are not representative of the regions around them. So for example, a measurement in Leeds wouldn't be re representative of the air pollutant concentrations we might see in Ilkley or Grassington. And this would be especially true if there was a fire, say on Asquith Moor. And so this makes it difficult to look at population exposure to pollutants using these observations in terms of if there was a fire. So this is where atmospheric chemistry transport models can come in useful. They can help us understand concentrations across regions, especially regions where there might not be observations. And they do this by representing these three key processes that control air pollutant concentrations. So the emission and secondary formation of air pollutants and then their dispersion and accumulation. However, they can't calculate all of the processes in every meter squared of meter cubed of the atmosphere, sorry, because this is very complex. And so instead, these models divide the Earth up into a series of boxes, which we refer to as um, grid boxes or grid cells. And they do this in the horizontal and the vertical. So we can see on the right here, this is the Europe region. And it's been split up into a series of 180 kilometer grid boxes. Um, and the model I use, we can look at much higher resolutions. So 30 kilometers or 10, even 10 kilometer grid box sizes. And in each of those grid boxes or grid cells, the model will calculate the air pollutant concentration based on the emission at the ground, the formation of secondary pollutants in the atmosphere, and then their dispersion and or accumulation. And one of the really useful things that models can do is we can run multiple scenarios or, um, um, through running multiple simulations. So for example, we could run two simulations, one where we include fire emissions and one where we don't include fire emissions. And then the difference between those two model simulations would give us the contribution of fires to the air pollutant concentration. So I used an atmospheric chemistry transport model called WARF-CHEM, 
which I run at 10 kilometer resolution over the UK for the Saddleworth Moor fires and 30 kilometer resolution over Australia for the Australia mega fires. And in the model, I read in fire emissions from a global data set called FIN. And this data set uses um, satellites to measure the hotspots that are caused by uh, fires. And we do this because fires change every year, so we have to have up-to-date emissions for them. And then I read in anthropogenic emissions from a, a global data set, again, called EDGAR. And this collates measured or reported emissions from different countries in, in the world into a single global data set. And this gives us our emission of different air pollutant species. So for example, particulate matter in this case. And then we can run those two simulations. So one simulation with the fires on and one with the fires off. And if we subtract the fires off from the fires on, this will give us the contribution of fires to PM in this case. And then we can use those simulations to look at the air quality impact of the fires and also the health impact of the fires. So I'll just start with the Saddleworth Moor wildfire in 2018. So the fire broke out on Saddleworth Moor, which is shown in this red circle, which is to the um, just to the east of uh, Manchester. And it broke out on the 24th of June. And it peaked in size on the 27th of June, at around eight kilometres squared. And we can see that this plume from the fire propagated out over the cities nearby, including Manchester, into the Irish Sea. And then this was brought under control by the firefighters on around the 29th of June. But then a second fire started on Winter Hill, which is just to the north of Bolton. And again, a plume propagated out over some cities close by into the Irish Sea. And one key reason that these, these fires happened is because the summer of 2018 was very hot and dry. So here I'm showing um, June 2018, I'm showing the temperature anomaly across the UK. So we can see that in June, um, the region where the fires occurred was around 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius above the 1981 to 2010 average. And alongside this, rainfall was around 25 to 50 millimetres below that average in June. And we can see that the fires had a large impact on air quality across the region. So here I'm showing some of the observational sites um, close to the fires. So two in Manchester and one in Wigan. And I'm showing a time series from the 16th of June to the 14th of July of PM 2.5 concentrations. And the observations from the ground-based um, sites are in black and then the model is in pink. So this is the model scenar uh, scenario where we included the fire emissions. And what we can see from the observations is that air pollutant concentrations of PM 2.5 reached over 200 micrograms um, on the 27th of June um, in Salford Eccles and over 100 micrograms at the other two sites. And the model generally captures the variability of the observations quite well. However, it doesn't capture the peaks, they're slightly underestimated. And this is likely due to the fact that we're comparing a 10 kilometer grid box with a point measurement. And so uh, the concentrations will be diluted. And then we can go on to look at the impact on air quality. So we do this by using the daily air quality index, which is used by the government um, to recommend changes in behavior based on the health impacts of PM 2.5. So we can see that for a moderate da daily air quality index, people with underlying health conditions should try and um, reduce their time outdoors if they experience symptoms. Whereas for a high daily air quality index, anybody who experiences symptoms should try and uh, reduce their time outdoors. 
And so what we do is we bin the PM 2.5 concentration in each of the grid boxes um, from the fire simulation by the daily air quality index value on each day. And this gives us a map of which areas were affected by different daily air quality index um, values. So that's what the colours are showing on this map. And we do this each day, so we get a time series between the 23rd and the 30th of June. Um, and then we can combine this with the population living in each grid box. And that tells us how many people are exposed to those different values on each day. And that's shown by the coloured numbers on these plots. So what we can see is that when the fires really kicked off on the 26th and 27th of June, large areas um, close to Saddleworth Moor and extending out to the west coast were affected by the fires, with quite large proportions of the population there being exposed to moderate, high or very high daily air quality index values. And we can also see the impact of the Winter Hill fires um, on the 30th, with the plume propagating out to the west and people underneath the plume being exposed to high PM2.5 concentrations. And then next what we can do is we can look at the impact on human health. So as I was saying before, we know that exposure to PM2.5 is associated with increases in mortality on both short and long time scales. So in this case, we're looking at a short time scale and exposure response functions can relate an exposure to a given concentration to an increase in mortality. So that's what this plot on the bottom is showing. We can see that mortality increases as concentrations of PM2.5 increase. And what this plot also shows is that there's a 1.04% increase in mortality per 10 microgram increase in PM2.5. And this has been derived from epidemiology studies. Um, an exposure response function works by calculating the relative risk. So that's the probability of mortality from a disease endpoint within a population that was exposed compared to a population that wasn't. And the relative risk is, is calculated by using the concentration of PM2.5 that the population in each grid box was exposed to. So that's our X value in this equation. And combining this with the beta value, which is the increase in mortality, which was 1.04% per 10 micrograms, and also the safe level of exposure. So that's the concentration of PM2.5 below which there are no negative health impacts. So we can take our exposure from the um, model simulations, so from the fire and the no fires, and we get this for the PM2.5 concentration in each grid box. And then we, we take the safe limit to be zero micrograms per meter cubed because there's very little evidence for a safe limit of PM2.5 exposure. And then from this, we can work out the attributable fraction. So that's the attributable fraction of mortality that was due to exposure to PM2.5. And then finally, we combine this attributable fraction with the baseline mortality rate, which we get from the Office of National Statistics. And we get this for each grid box. And also with the population data. So how many people are exposed in each grid box? and we get that from the census. And this gives us an excess mortality for the fires and the no fires simulation. And if we subtract the no fires simulation from the fire simulation, that will give us the number of deaths that were due to fires, PM2.5 from fires, I should say. So here I'm showing the results for the no fire simulation. And we can see that this goes from the 16th of June to the 14th of July and there's some variability um, on a daily basis and this is likely due to um, changes in meteorology affecting the pollutant concentrations that people are exposed to on different days 
And what we can see is that between the 23rd and 30th of June, 2.6 deaths were brought forward um, in the no-fire simulation due to exposure to PM2.5. And then if we plot on top of this, the number of deaths brought forward from exposure to PM2.5 in the fire simulation, we can see that it's considerably higher than the no-fire simulation, particularly between um, the 25th and the 30th of June. And if we take the difference between these simulations, we can, um, con uh, we can attribute the deaths brought forward to the PM2.5 from the fires. So we can see that in total, between the 23rd of June and the 30th of June, 3.8 deaths were brought forward due to PM2.5 exposure from the fires. So we can see that it, these fires can have a considerable health impact in the UK. And now I'm going to move on to um, the Australian bushfires, which happened in 2019 and 2020. So this was one of the worst fire seasons in history in Australia, and it's since been called the Black Summer. And fires began in October 2019 and didn't end until February 2020. And in this time, around 190,000 um, kilometres were burnt. So just for scale, that's an area almost the size of the UK. And 2,600 homes were destroyed in that time and 34 people were killed. And alongside this, more than a billion animals died. And this is actually expected to increase in the coming years because of how much habitat destruction the fires caused. Um, and on Kangaroo Island alone, 50,000 koalas are thought to have died in the fires. So it really had some sh shocking and substantial impacts. And the fires are thought to have partly be been caused um, by this very strong Indian Ocean dipole, which occurred in 2019. So this is nicknamed the Indian El Nino. And it, it, um, it's very similar to El Nino. So what we see is we see warmer than average um, sea surface temperatures off the west coast of India and cooler than average um, sea surface temperatures in Southeast Asia and to the north of Australia. And this causes a reversal in the circulation over that region, um, meaning that the surface winds switch from easterly, so transporting moisture over Australia, to westerly, um, transporting moisture over to eastern Africa. And this leads to increased rainfall um, over East Africa, and we often see fl big flooding events. And as a result of this moisture transport away from Australia, we see reductions in rainfall over the Australian continent. And around 10 to 15 millimetres less rainfall per month in eastern Australia. And in 2019, this positive Indian Ocean dipole is thought to have increased the severity of rainfall shortages in New South Wales and Queensland, which are in the east of Australia. And po um, positive Indian Ocean dipoles are generally linked to Australia's droughts. And every single um, South Australian drought since the 1890s has been due to Indian Ocean dipole. Alongside this, the Western Indian Ocean is projected to warm at an accelerated rate due to climate change, which is projected to lead to more um, positive Indian Ocean dipoles occurring, which would have impacts on Australia by increasing the frequency of droughts, especially in Eastern Australia. So here I'm showing a map of um, fire emissions. Um, so on the left, I'm showing the fires between October um, and January. And the fires are coloured by their size. So the darker the shade, the larger the fire. And what we can see is um, that the fires move south um, over that time period and also become larger. And we can see this from the fin emissions, which are the emissions I read into Wharfchem. So this goes from March through to February, 
and the year of the fires 2019-2020 is shown in blue and this is um, emissions each day of PM 2.5 and we can see that um, as the fires moved south they emitted much more PM 2.5 peaking in December and January and if we compare this to previous year's emissions so here I'm showing 2010 to 2018 in red and I'm showing the really high values and the really low values of those years and what we can see is that the 2019-2020 fire emissions were much above what we'd ever seen before so this red shading is barely visible um, in December and January because those emissions in 2019 and 2020 were so large. And so we can look at the impact on the monthly mean air quality using those two uh, wharf chem simulations of PM 2.5. So here I'm showing the with fires each month and the without fires each month. And on the with fires plots, I've just added on um, the observations. So the monthly mean concentration observed at the ground based monitoring sites in Australia. And what we can see is that in October, there's not much difference between um, the fires and the no fires simulation. PM 2.5 concentrations are slightly higher in this northern uh, region. So around Brisbane, Newcastle and Sydney. Um, but we see a really substantial increases um, in the fire simulation in November. Um, so we see that is really dominating, um, uh, dominated around the Sydney and Newcastle region and, and sort of spanning up towards Brisbane. And it's much higher than in the no fire simulation. And then in December and January, we can see the fires intensify and move south. So we see that PM 2.5 concentrations um, in Newcastle, Sydney and Canberra and to the north of Melbourne are much higher in the fire simulation than the no fire simulation. And PM 2.5 concentrations peak in January just to the north of Melbourne and they're impacting uh, Cram Canberra um, during this time. And we can see that the model generally uh, agrees quite well with the observations, though it's generally a little bit lower um, in the regions that were affected by the fires. And then we can do a similar thing to the Saddleworth Moor fires where we look at the impact on the air quality index. So in Australia, this is calculated in a slightly different way. So the air quality index is calculated by taking the air pollutant concentration in each model grid box and dividing it by the pollutant standard. So in Australia, that's 25 micrograms per meter cubed. And then we multiply by 100 to get an air quality index value. And this fits into one of six bins. So you can see that they're slightly smaller than the daily air quality index um, values. But they have similar guidance. So at a poor uh, air quality index value, um, we see that this air quality is um, is unhealthy for people with underlying health conditions. However, um, in the very poor air quality bin, everyone may experience health um, effects of the pollution. So if we do this for each model grid box on each day, we can uh, then combine this with the population in those grid boxes on each day and look at how many people were exposed to different air quality index values on each day. So first I do this across Australia. So this plot showing the fires and the no fire simulation and it's showing the air quality index um, value that um, people are exposed to on, on each day. So it goes from the start of September through to February. And this y-axis is telling us how many uh, million people are exposed. So it goes from zero up to 10 million. And what we can see is there's very little difference between or no difference between the fires and the no fires simulation in September, which we would expect because there was no fires during that time. And so during this time, pretty much the whole population was exposed to very good 
air quality index, or at least good. Uh, but then we can see the impact of the fires starting to become obvious. So we can see that in October, there's much more population exposure to fair and poor air quality um, index values in the fire simulation. So around 5 million people were exposed to fair or um, poor air quality index values uh, it, on multiple days in October. And then we can see that the fires are really intensifying in November and December. And up to 5 million people are exposed to very poor or hazardous air quality on several days in December. And this continues through December into January, when again, more than 5 million people are exposed to hazardous air quality um, on multiple days. And then we can split this by city because we know the fires move from north to south. And so um, we'll, we'll see different exposure in different cities at different times. So here I'm showing some of the large cities um, on the eastern coast. So it generally goes from north to south. So Brisbane's the northernmost city and then Sydney and Newcastle are fairly close together and Canberra is to the south of this and then Melbourne is further south still and Adelaide is to the east of Melbourne. And what we can see is that um, people in Brisbane were exposed to fair or poor air quality to start with so they experienced the earliest exposure to it and this was in um, October and November and then the fires start to shift further south and intensify and start to affect Sydney and Newcastle and we can see that in December in Sydney the entire population was exposed to very poor air quality on multiple days and we can also see that it had large impacts on Newcastle slightly later on so in mid-December the whole population in that city was exposed to very poor or hazardous air quality on multiple days and then the fires shift further south and we can see that the air quality impacts in Canberra were very very large in December um, in mid to late December and we can see that the entire population in that city was exposed to hazardous air quality on several days and then finally the the fires shift further south and start to affect Melbourne in January when um, almost the whole population was exposed to very poor or hazardous air quality on several days and we can see that in contrast Adelaide was largely unaffected by the fires because it was further east uh, further west sorry than the fires were occurring and so if I lived in Australia during the fires then I would definitely um, have wanted to pick Adelaide to live in And then we can finally look at the impact on health. So we do this in the same way as we did with the Saddleworth Moor fires. And here I'm just showing the total number of deaths brought forward in the no fires and the fires um, only part of the simulations um, between September and February. And I've split it by region here and also by city. So we can see that the region that was most largely affected by the fires in terms of health was New South Wales. And this really dominated uh, the overall health impact. Um, and this is largely due to that region having a large population and also that population being exposed on many days to high um, PM2.5 concentrations. But we can also see that although um, the health impacts were smaller in places like Australian Capital Territory, which is the region around Canberra, the actual fraction of the total mortality that was due to fires alone is very large in this region. And that's likely due to that high population exposure on those multiple days that we saw in the city level air quality index analysis. And then if we split this by city, we can look at which cities 
contributed to those overall regional health impacts that we see. So we can see that um, the largest health impact was seen in Sydney, which is not unexpected since it's in New South Wales, and it has a large population that was exposed on many days. But we can see that in total in that city, 54 deaths were brought forward due to the fires. Um, and, and the health impacts in Newcastle are quite a bit smaller than Sydney. And this is likely due to the population being much smaller in that city, although the exposure was for a prolonged period at high levels. And in total, 158 deaths were brought forward um, by PM2.5 from the fires across East Australia. So you can see it had a large health impact. And so I just wanted to finish off with what about the future? So we know that climate change is forcing this um, cycle of um, more fires, which are more intense and increased emissions, which then in turn cause an increase in global temperature. And so we can stop this feedback loop in several ways or at least try to reduce it. So the first way would be to reduce the buildup and dry out of fuel. And something that they've used in California for this has been the introduction of goats. So goats forage that dry, um, low level fuel that causes fires um, to start and also helps them to spread. And so they're a really easy way to reduce um, that buildup of dry fuel. And then in the UK, there's sort of two strands of thought on this. So one, um, one way that people think we could reduce um, the build up and dry out of fuel is by managing land. So burning off the fuel before it gets to a critically flammable state. And that's what's often done on moorland. So it would be similar to what they, they use to manage moorlands. Or alternatively, we could restore the moorlands to more natural um, fire resilient species. So encouraging peat bogs to um, regenerate in those areas. Um, and there's many co-benefits to this. So because we would increase the, the species diversity of um, vegetation there, we would also encourage biodiversity in animals. And alongside this, it, would, it has also been shown to reduce the speed of runoff off land. So it could also be used to help um, prevent flooding. And secondly, we could uh, prevent ignition of fires because they can't start if there's no ignition. And there's a few ways that have been used to do this. So um, I'm sure many of you will have seen that in the summer, the Peak District banned um, disposable barbecue um, being able to be bought in, in that region and um, just to prevent that risk being there. Uh, in Australia they take a bit more of a hardline approach so uh, in Australia there's a fine of $11,000 for throwing a cigarette out of the window because the risk is so high there of wildfires starting. But I think the key to this is education so people need to know what the risks are and when the highest. And I think this could help really prevent wildfire starting. And then finally, we could tackle climate change. So we can all do little things to reduce our carbon footprint. So I'm sure lots of us will have reduced our long haul flight footprint this year with not being able to travel. But there's lots of other little things we can do. And so to conclude, Wildfires are likely to occur more frequently and be more severe due to climate change and their impacts on air quality and health can be large as I've shown here, but we can take action to prevent their likelihood and to reduce their impacts in the future. Thank you. Can't hear you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I, I think I think what for chairs in the future, what we do is we have a little sound file of applause because that seems to be what uh, uh, we're seeing on the television. Because it's it's strange giving a you know giving a talk and then not hearing any 
uh, uh, applause after it. So, um, yes, that was very interesting, Ailish. So we've got some questions to leech, uh, leap straight into. So um, Grant has asked a question. So um, did forest management or lack of it play a role in the Australian wildfires or is it the period or is it the severity of the recent uh, Indian dipole um, that drove it? There we go. <clears throat> so I've just posted the question on the screen there as well so that people can see it as well. So I'm not sure I can comment on whether forest management played a role, but what I do know is that across Australia um, for the previous five years, we'd seen an increase in the amount of um, dry fuel or the amount of land in a, in a critically dry state. And they think that this played a role in how intense and quickly um, and also how quickly the fires spread. So I think um, it's obviously driven by the climate. Um, and I, I'm not sure I can comment on on whether forest management played a role, I'm afraid. I, mean, I think just to add, I think the region because wildfires are not uncommon. So they do tend to put some controls in. It's just uh, I think it was uh, everything lined up for them this year, uh, last year. So it might be interesting to see what happens this year because we're entering into their, their annual fire season. So um, then we've got a, a question from uh, an ex ooh, uh, an ex uh, Leeds uh, researcher. So um, and it's uh, interesting talk. So was there an increase observed in things like hospital admissions during the fires? Um, yeah, so there's actually a, a paper out um, by a PhD student in Tasmania that looked at the impact on hospital admissions. Um, and they found that there was an increase in respiratory and cardiac admissions um, during that period. Um, and that was largest in New South Wales, from what I remember. So uh, everything stacked up, the, uh, the, the health impacts were already visible. So, and then we've got a question from um, Jordan. It says, due to the blurring, um, I guess it's a resolution uh, issue, um, the, from the 10 kilometer wharf model, should these results be considered a low estimate? So, because you're not capturing the features as we saw in the Saddleworth Moor results. Um, yeah, so our estimate is um, on the low side. However, we don't really have a way to adjust for this. Um, we just have to accept that the model can't capture those peaks because of its resolution. So I think if, if a model was run at a higher resolution over that region, we could um, get a more representative health impact that would be slightly higher. Um, however, the uncertainty in, in that estimate is really dominated by that exposure response function. Um, and so although our, an estimate might be higher with a, um, a model at a higher resolution, the uncertainty would still sort of dominate that um, health impact assessment. Yeah, because uh, hopefully that makes yeah, sense. The, at, the, at the much higher concentrations, it can have a, a, a very acute um, impact on people. So uh, it's a non-linear function. So um, and then a uh, question from uh, uh, Lindsay says, do you think people understand the impacts on their health? So uh, this is the you know, people in Australia. Um, during the fires, she saw lots of people jogging in Sydney uh, in extremely polluted air. So do you, you know? Do we need more education? Or do they need to be more educated? Uh, were they complacent yeah. in going out and exposing themselves? Um, I would say so. I mean, at ambient concentrations that we see, the benefits of exercise far outweigh um, the negative health impacts of air pollution. But at the concentrations that they saw, 
the recommendation is not to do strenuous exercise outside. They will irritate their lungs by breathing in that pollution. And so I guess uh, further education is necessary um, if people are taking uh, not risky, I guess, risky behaviours like that and running outside in such high pollution. Yeah, I mean, gen generally people who are uh, susceptible are wary of this sort of thing. But it's it's the people who, who think they're a bit more um, l less vulnerable. Um, they could they could exacerbate uh, underlying conditions that they weren't aware of. So um, Hannah's asked, uh, are there any other case studies that you will be looking at in your research? Um, sadly, I've run out of time in my PhD to do that. So we did. We did manage, I would love to. We did but... manage to cram, cram this one in as a, a, a final flourish. So uh, and then George. George asks. Oh. Uh, on your Australian air quality impact graph, there was an early uh, poor air quality episode that wasn't caused by a fire. Um, any thoughts of what might have caused that? Um, so I guess they were fairly similar between the fires and the no fire simulation. So that would suggest to me that it was a meteorological um, thing or, or possibly changes in emissions. But I think it's more likely to be changes in meteorology that are affecting the pollutant concentrations um, because they will both occur in um, both simulations. Okay, thank you. So, uh, and the next one, another question from uh, Grant. Uh, most bushfires are in the hills, while the population in the cities are largely near the sea, except for Canberra. Does the modelling take into account this altitude difference between the the generation and exposure regions so where the fires are and where the people are breathing in the air um yeah so i've taken the surface layer of the model here which follows the terrain of the land so that will mean that it's estimating people's exposure based on um the actual part of the atmosphere that they live in and um, so we are comparing apples with apples even though people live at different heights so I guess um, the only difference would be that in places that are close to the sea, you would get this land sea breeze, which might reduce concentrations for those populations slightly. Yeah, I, I was going to say that the, the, the land and sea breeze might have a, a an influence on that, because I guess the fires are not, they would have been burning all the time. So, um, and then a question from uh, Joseph. So do you think health impacts of prescribed moorland burning that takes place over the UK uplands in the UK every year could be greater than from the occasional peat wildfires. Um, yes, I guess in areas where this happens a lot, that population is going to be exposed on multiple um, at multiple times in the year, and so that exposure over a year would be larger than a short exposure, or maybe larger than a short exposure from a one large fire but i think the problem here is that um the fire emissions data sets that we use really struggle to capture or detect very small fires like um the ones that would be used to manage moorland and so it's really difficult for us to actually look at the health impacts of those fires over a year because we can't actually um come up with um realistic estimates of emissions because the fires are so difficult to detect so i think that might be an interesting topic to look into in the future when these satellites are able to detect smaller fires um better so more resolution always the case with satellites observations yeah. and models that's what everybody wants yeah. more resolution both spatial and temporal so that's just a, a, a challenge for anybody building satellites. So um, Rex is a question. There's just a couple of questions left now. Um, so are there possible effect? Are, are there possible effects from tropical cyclones? Uh, remnants uh, possibly landing around eastern coast of Australia in the in summer in the frequency of wildfires in the future? Um. So you mean in the is this in the projections in the future? Um, yes, I, I, I guess so. Uh, I'm not sure I can comment on that. I'm, I don't know. 
um, I could look into it and get back to you, but I, I don't know. I guess that, that, that's a more a tropical meteorology um, yeah. question. So, but it does show the, the, this concept of a teleconnection. So between, um, you know, the tropical cyclones and then the, the Indian uh, dipoles. So they're, they're all linked and they all do connect into each other. So, and, and, the, and there's always an El Nino uh, component lurking off in the distance. So um, our final question is, um, what is the main cause of ignition for wildfires? And I guess that could be, uh, is, is it the same for areas like Saddleworth Moor and Australia? Um, uh, quite, quite surprising. I'd forgotten how big the fine for uh, chucking a cigarette out the window uh, in Australia. $11,000 uh, is, is, would give you, make you give up smoking. So do you, what do you think the main causes of ignitions are? So I know in the UK, the main causes are um, human activity. So generally uh, fires that are started by accident. And so I think that's why that's the key. The key way to tackle fires in the UK is is to educate people um, so that these ignitions of fires don't occur. Um, in Australia, I think it's less. There's definitely um, based on um, their policies. So really high fines for starting fires and actually um, prison sentences there. People are much less likely to start a fire and I think they're more aware and better educated on the risks. Um, so in Australia, if uh, there's a high fire risk, people aren't allowed to have barbecues or fires outside. Um, and so that's really helped them reduce um, the amount of fires that are caused by people. Um, I'm not entirely sure what started the fires in 2019 and 2020, but I know that one of the key reasons that they um, carried on as long as they did is because uh, the heat from the fires caused these big thunderclouds to develop. And then there was um, lightning strikes from those fires that helped the fires to progress southwards and so started more fires from the lightning. So, so literally a self-sustaining wildfire yeah it's a, a, quite a terrifying um thought and so just one thing that um i i thought of recently so for those um not not in yorkshire there was there was a there was a large uh fire at a tire dump in bradford uh about three weeks ago um and uh i'm quite keen to look to try and work out the health impacts of that because we could smell the smoke in leeds um, and it was right in the centre of uh, Bradford. So that downwind of the fire, there was probably uh, approaching 100,000 people who were breathing in those fumes for a week. Uh, and burning tyres are considerably more toxic than burning uh, moorland and things like that. So uh, and that was arson. So, you know, these, these are some horrific things So they can. Uh, and that could have a long lasting um, effect. So um, with that, I'd like to um, thank everybody for joining us tonight and particularly uh, thank uh, Ailish um, for presenting her work. Um, I must admit that I, I suggested this to her and dropped it on her while she's trying to finish off her PhD. So um, I think to, uh, congratulations for, for doing that. And just to uh, remind people of our, our next talk, so it's Tuesday, the, or the next talk from the um, Royal Metsock, and it's uh, on Tuesday, the 26th of January. Um, and it's if, if a particle forms in a city, does anyone breathe it in or is it just all hazy? So that's a, a talk from Professor Neil Donoghue um, from Carnegie Mellon. So that'll be a very, very interesting uh, talk um, towards the end of January um, for next year. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Um, this, this meeting has been recorded, um, so it will be available, as all our talks have been, will be available uh, and it will be posted to everybody who uh, joined us this evening. So it'll be there for you to uh, go back or if uh, you've got friends who missed it um, or people, I know people use this for uh, teaching at schools and things like that. So it's, it's available for people to use. So with that, I'd like to 
thank everybody and wish everybody uh, a good evening. Goodbye.